Hi everybody, we're going to get started now. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, program today, which we're very excited about having uh, a speaker of such renown here. And as part of the uh, Women's Issues and Beyond uh, theme that we've been having since February, March, and in April, and we'll be having more programs in May this year. And Pat Demio, who is on the Women's Issues Committee, and also is in, works in health services, has arranged this wonderful program for us today. And I want to welcome you and thank everybody for coming. And I'll ask Pat to introduce uh, Joellen Hawkins. Hi, welcome. I want to introduce Joellen Hawkins, uh, Dr. Joellen Hawkins from Boston College, who is doing research on domestic violence issues and pregnancy. I think this is a very important issue that needs to be looked at very closely in our society. She'll be focusing on assessing ways to determine if this is actually going on in someone's life. We have with us Dan Buckley from STAR. He works with men who are batterers. He's available for any questions that you have uh, on any of these uh, domestic conflict issues. Um, on the back table, there are a number of handouts that we have available, both from Joellen and from Health Services. Um, help yourself, come back and ask questions if you need to. Uh, people are available. Uh, today in the Boston Globe, there were two articles about abuse issues. One was actually about a website, wife, wifebeaters.com, oh, something I saw like that. that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on out there that condones this kind of thing. And the other issue was a man who's probably, or who is trying, but I hope will not get off on his uh, trial on the issue that he thought that he was having consensual sex, even though he was bashing the woman's head into the floor. He claims that he thought it was consensual. There's no explaining these kinds of things. I tried to get issues copies of it off of the uh, computer, but I couldn't do it. Maybe somebody here could and give me a hand, because I'd like to get those. Okay, Joellen Hawkins. Just for all of you who are nurses or nursing students in the group who would like continuing education units for this program, on the back table there's a sign in, if you'll sign in as you leave, um, and then we'll give you a certificate. So we wanted to make that available to you. As Pat said, I'm the, uh, by default, <laughs> you know, everybody's finger pointed at me. I'm the principal investigator for an NIH, National Institutes of Nursing Research funded project studying abuse during pregnancy. Um, Pat's classmate from Boston College, Joyce Dwyer, is the reason I'm here, really. And she's part of the team. We have team members from Boston College, UMass Lowell, and UMass Boston, and eight prenatal sites. However, I'm going to talk more broadly about domestic violence, and recognizing that although about 90% of victims are female, I don't want to ignore the fact that males can be victims of, of intimate partner violence or child abuse as children, sexual abuse as young people, as ba everywhere from babies on up. And there can be female to female and male to male partner abuse. So I don't want you to think that I think that all victims are, of abuse are women because they're not. Unfortunately, the majority are. But certainly um, men figure into the, to the victim category as well. <clears throat> In this country, about three to four million women a year experience some kind of violence that we would consider intimate partner violence in their lives. There are about 4,000 homicides a year that are directly the result of domestic violence, and we're talking about adults now. That does not include children who are um, victims. And as Pat was mentioning about the Globe, if you've read the Globe recently, uh, many times men end up being victims of domestic violence, not from their partner, but from a former partner of a partner, and just happen to be the, the hapless victims um, of the rage that, that the perpetrator is, is engaged in. Over half of women who are murdered are murdered by present or former 
partners. So when there is a homicide involving a woman victim, most likely she knows the perpetrator and has had some kind of relationship. 40% of battered women are raped by their partners, so sexual abuse is a very big part of it. And when I talk a little more, by, by the way, on the back, page, uh, back table, I also put a copy of the instrument that we're using for screening. So even though um, I'm not going to talk about it directly in any other way, you can take copies of that instrument. It is not copyrighted. Please use it uh, for anyone uh, practicing in not a prenatal care setting, any other setting, you can just take out the word pregnant and just say, in the current year, in this current year, the last 12 months, have you been, and then all the questions. And this instrument only takes 45 seconds to administer. So it's a very quick screen. There are a lot of good um, data on this particular screening instrument. Um, the most frequent women, reason that women go to emergency rooms is because of domestic violence and ER folks are well aware of that. And then I will talk about some of the um, particular complaints that women will come in with, present with, that are really masking the fact that they are victims of domestic violence, but they're bringing the women into the care system. Uh, Sociocultural factors. Minority ethnicity is not linked particularly to domestic violence. That's one of the myths that poor People of minority status are, are the victims. No. Unfortunately, this is an equal opportunity problem. Um, certainly, there are cultural differences in, what, um, in relationships and what people deem to be abusive versus a not abusive situation. And part of our responsibility as, as health care providers is to validate for women and others who are enduring some kind of physical, mental, emotional, or economic abuse that in fact it does constitute abuse in this culture, in this country. And that whereas some of the behaviors might be tolerated in another country, that they're not acceptable in the United States. <clears throat> who can be a batterer? Anyone. Your next door neighbor, your roommate, your roommate's brother, your roommate's father, your own relative, doctors, nurses, ministers, priests. We certainly have ample evidence of that in the newspapers, don't we? And members of the police, the military. I do know from a former student who worked on this project with us while she was a graduate student, she now works on the problem of battering in the military because she is a military member of the military personnel and so is her husband. And she said the problem is absolutely rampant in the military. And she finds more than enough to do uh, with educating men and women about appropriate interpersonal interactions and what constitutes abuse. <clears throat> Battering during pregnancy in particular, we really don't know the incidence. There are a lot of anecdotal data that tell us that battering escalates during pregnancy. Sometimes it starts during pregnancy. But the studies to date show ranges anywhere between 4 and 21 percent of pregnant women are battered. Our study in our database at the current time we have, out of our eight study sites, we have well over 4,000 cases so far entered into the database. So we'll have a pretty good handle on the incidence of abuse that women are, are responding in some, in, positively to one or more of the questions on the questionnaire. And about 50% of women in the study sites are being screened in spite of the fact that one of the standards of care in prenatal settings is to screen for abuse. But clearly 50% of women are not being screened. Or at least there is no documentation in the records to suggest in any way that they're being screened for abuse. So that's concerning because it is a standard of practice. Um, so far, our data are showing that the rate um, of abuse is higher in teens than it is among women 18 years and older, but our data set is not complete yet. And other studies, uh, Barb Parker, uh, Judy McFarlane, and Jackie Campbell, who are three of the nurse researchers, and Sarah Torres, four nurse researchers in this area, 
um, their rates are about comparable to ours that they're finding in their studies, which is around uh, 12 to 13 percent, but higher in teens, just as we're finding. Um, <clears throat> pregnancy does, may increase the battering. Sometimes battering does begin in pregnancy. When you go on anecdotal woman-by-woman -woman stories, um, this loving partner all of a sudden becomes threatened by the, apparently by the intrusion of a third person into the dyad and perhaps losing um, the primary status in the relationship. That seems to be a factor that, that women talk to us about. Interestingly enough, and, and this goes along with all my clinical experiences because I have never practiced in a uh, private practice. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner and I practice at the current time in a community health center that focuses on adolescents and I also practice at Pine Street Inn which probably most of you know is the largest shelter system for homeless people in, in New England. And I'm in, I'm in the women's clinic and I teach a prenatal class. And every woman, every guest at Pine Street Inn, woman guest whom I have encountered so far, um, has abuse in her background, universally. So abuse is, whether it was child abuse, child sexual abuse, abuse as an adolescent by an intimate partner, whatever. Every single woman whom I have met so far. So it, clearly there's a, a strong link between homelessness and abuse. Women find themselves needing to get out of situations and they end up homeless. And at the other end of the age spectrum, I should mention that elder abuse is a major reason that older women end up homeless because they're being abused by their own children, adult children, and they're ending up homeless. Um, a few effects of violence in pregnancy and why pregnancy is an important time to screen women, but not the only time. Every individual in every healthcare encounter should be screened for abuse. Male, female, young, old. Every single individual should have the opportunity to be screened for abuse because eventually that individual, if he or she is being abused, is going to trust a healthcare provider enough to reveal what's going on. Um, and if we keep asking, eventually people will realize that maybe it's something that they can talk about, that, that the environment is safe. If we do nothing else than to leave brochures around, have a flyer in the back of the bathroom doors that said, are you being abused in a relationship? Maybe a little description. Eventually, people get the message that this is a safe place to talk about abuse. So the first time you ask, the second, the tenth time, the person may still deny it, but eventually we hope that most people will feel safe with someone to reveal what's really going on. Why is it particularly important in pregnancy? Well, first of all, we've got a baby to be concerned about. And a pregnant woman who is being physically battered um, is less likely to have a healthy baby. She's more likely to have a low birth weight baby. She's more likely to use substances during her pregnancy because Smoking, drinking, or using street drugs may be her only way of coping with the abuse that she's enduring. So she continues to use those substances because they are the only comfort she has. She may be being forced to use these substances by her abuser. Many women tell stories of waking up, realizing they've been unconscious, and they probably got shot up by their partner. Um, recently had a woman who was not pregnant with that kind of story at Pine Street Inn, who woke up in the morning, been with a partner, woke up, doesn't remember anything all of a sudden, and then woke up with a big um, puncture mark in her arm. Um, abruption of the pregnancy, meaning the placenta de uh, detaches from the abdominal wall, is possible with blows to the abdomen, so that's another major risk. And miscarriage rates are higher among women who are physically abused than they are among uh, women who are not physically abused. <clears throat> so the other neat thing about pregnancy is that we have an opportunity to see women and, uh, and establish a relationship of trust over a, a nine-month period of time, more or less, or maybe a month or two before that, uh, less than that. So we have an opportunity to see this woman repeatedly. She builds a sense of trust with us and she may eventually then be concerned enough for herself and her unborn child 
to reveal to us that she is being abused, she may not be ready to do anything about it, but it is an opportunity in a way in a woman's life. Whereas normally, uh, if a woman has no chronic diseases and is a healthy young woman in her childbearing years, we may see her at most once a year. So we don't have as many opportunities to, for her to build trust with us. Some misconceptions about abuse. <clears throat> Battered women are poor. No. Battered women run the whole gamut across the socioeconomic um, level. And as I started to say a minute ago, it's a myth that um, clinic, women who attend clinics are less likely to be screened. In fact, the reverse is true. We have snobbery in healthcare, where a lot of providers say what I call the, the NIMP syndrome, not in my patient population. You know, I don't need to screen for abuse because none of my patients are abused. You know, this is a private obstetrician in Weston. I don't think so, you know. Um, in fact, women who attend public or privately funded clinics are a lot more likely to be screened um, because they are also likely to get a lot more teaching about pregnancy, incidentally, than they are in a private practice. Um, just amazing that sometimes uh, those of us who think we are delivering what some might perceive as second-class health care really turns out to be the better health care because we are sensitive to these issues, we're following the standards of care. <clears throat> and I already did away with the myth about uh, ethnic origins. Battering is found across the educational spectrum. There are women at Pine Street Inn who are there because of abuse who have master's degrees. There are women there who have a second grade education. So it runs all the way. And two of the victims of elder abuse who were guests at Pine Street Inn for a brief time, both had been school nurses in the Boston system their whole careers. So they're well-educated women who had a professional life who were being battered by their adult children when they ended up living with them. <clears throat> Abused women or anyone who's a victim bring it on themselves or deserve it. And this is something we, we work very hard with women who, as we turn them around from being victims to survivors, to dispel that it's not your fault. Not your fault. It's not some inherent flaw in your character or as um, a woman lawyer in telling her story, she used to be a district attorney in Massachusetts, Sarah Buell tells the story of going to the library and getting out five books on cooking rice because she figured if she could only cook the rice right, he wouldn't hit her anymore. She was not a lawyer at the time. She's gone on to be a lawyer and, a, and an advocate for battered women. But she figured, you know, something's wrong with me. I can't cook the rice right, and that's why he beats me. And finally, one day, she said, wait a minute. This isn't about me. This is about him. You know, I'm the victim. But it took her a long time to turn that thinking around. Abused women can leave or victims can leave any time. No. Oftentimes there's such tight economic ties. Um, this may be a woman who hasn't been in the workforce for a while. This may be a child, an older adult who has limited income and has, doesn't have options. So. To blame the victim twice by saying, well, you could leave, you know, is not as simple as it sounds. Types of abuse I've already alluded to, but I want to talk to them about them in a little more depth. Physical abuse can run the gamut from threats of abuse, threats with a weapon, including baseball bats, guns, knives, anything that could be used as a weapon. Grabbing, pinching, shoving, slapping, hitting, hair pulling. Women have come in with big chunks of their hair pulled out. Biting, arm twisting, kicking, punching, hitting with blunt objects, stabbing and shooting, the whole gamut. Withholding access to resources, limiting medications, medical care, uh, food, fluids, sleep, hygiene, anything you can think of. Uh, batterers may restrict um, access. And this can go across the lifespan. This could be an elder who's not getting enough to eat or is not having his or her hygiene needs tended to, to children who cannot fend for themselves. And obviously, 
may be too young to go out and buy food or access food in any other way. And the, the, the batterer is using food as, as a weapon. Uh, forcing alcohol or drugs, I mentioned in the context of pregnant women, of course that can happen to anyone. Sexual abuse, coercion or forcing coercion as the case Pat mentioned, uh, consensual sex when the woman's head is being beaten into the, the concrete, I don't think so. Forced sex after beatings, attacks on sexual body parts, women come in with tremendous bruises on their breasts or genitals. Forced prostitution, forced unprotected sex, so the woman runs the, preg the risk not only of pregnancy but also sexually transmitted diseases and heaven forbid even perhaps HIV. Fondling, <coughs> forcing sex with others and sodomy, use of pornography, and attempts to undermine the sexuality of the individual, to control that person's body completely. Economic abuse. This is probably one that we talk less about than we do physical abuse. Um, but it is a very important one. Maintaining total control over finances. So the victim uh, has no money that she or he controls at all. The perpetrator is constantly controlling the money and doling it out and checking the mileage on the car to make sure she hasn't gone anywhere but where she said she was going to go or he. Um, restricting education and employment. Um, the next phase of our project is an intervention phase uh, in which we are working with a visiting nurse association, a police department, and the local hospital and, and providers. And one part of that is going to be um, working with the school system as well. At any one time in the city in which we're working, currently working, there are about 15 restraining orders at the local high school against intimate partners. So the, high, the school system has to deal with young people who aren't to be near each other because there's a restraining order. So they have to figure out things like, you can't go down that hallway because he's going to be coming from class in that hallway or he's got to use a different entrance all kinds of restrictions so you can see how pervasive this problem is and these are generally teens who are you know fighting with each other or bashing each other or have caused other physical harm so it even restricts that individuals who's the victims right to go to school and to participate fully in school activities uh, it could extend to colleges and universities, of course. I'm sure colleges and universities also deal with restraining orders because I know of cases where that is the, tr the case, where a perpetrator is not to come within, you know, 100 feet of Bristol Community College or come off the side road or whatever because of the um, victim's rights being protected by a restraining order. The, the last but not least of these is, is running up bills that the victim has to pay. And I, had a, I have a colleague who was enduring this kind of abuse in, in her marriage. Um, she didn't have any physical abuse, she didn't have any emotional abuse, but she had economic abuse. Her husband would take credit cards and run up bills that, and then she was the one working because he was writing the great American novel. Well, if that isn't abuse, I don't know what is. They had three children, you know, and she was paying the bills. Emotional abuse, another underestimated kind of abuse. No one needs to lay a hand on someone for that person to be a victim of abuse. Undermining a person's sense of worth, constant criticism, belittling anything the individual does, name calling, insults, the silent treatment, manipulating behavior so the victim is constantly made to feel that she or he is doing something wrong, if only I could do it right, everything would be fine, um, and he wouldn't yell at me anymore. Uh, subverting the partner's relationship with children or other family members and isolating the victim, uh, more and more isolating the victim from, well, I don't want you to talk to your sister anymore, and you've got to stop going over to your mother's. And, and survivors will tell us these stories. I was so isolated 
that I couldn't call my mother. He monitored the phone bill, all these kinds of things. So emotional abuse can be as damaging and devastating as any physical abuse can be. And finally, making and breaking repeated promises. I promise this will never happen again. You know, or I will be there to pick up the kids, or that sort of thing. And then not doing it, not following through. And leaving the, oftentimes leaving the victim in an awkward position because if the partner was supposed to pick the kids up at daycare and didn't, who's going to get the blame? The woman or the person who's the prime caretaker of the kids if it happens to be the father of the children who's the prime caretaker. Then he's taking the heat or she's taking the heat from the daycare providers because they don't know the arrangements with the secondary caregiver. And it may be that the ability to even have the children in the system um, or the kids we were talking about whose parents are keeping them out of school. You know, it may be the other parent who even might become the, the victim in it, thinking the kids are in school and in fact they're not because the abusive person is keeping them out of school. Uh, psychological abuse can also be, of course, threatening physical harm without actually carrying through. I mean, how many of us would like to have a gun held to our heads and with a threat of, if you do this once more, I'm going to use this? It may never happen, but that's a pretty terrifying way to live. Um, or threatening physical harm to the children or to the mother, the father. Typically, kids who are victims of child sexual abuse um, are intimidated by their abuser by such things as, if you tell your mother I will kill her, or I will run over your brother, or I will shoot your father. So children will not tell that something's happening to them because they want to protect their parents. Threats with objects or weapons, threatening to harm or kidnap the kids, menacing behavior, showing up at perhaps a relative's house, um, with a gun or some other kind of physical threat, um, intimidating the victim, but also the victim's family. Blackmail, harassment. Many uh, victims tell stories of being harassed at work, constant phone calls, um, visits by the perpetrator that disrupt work and put the person's work life at jeopardy, and destruction of property. Um, such as pets or, or physical property, destroying clothes, burning someone's clothes, destroying someone's car. Mind games, undermining any personal relationships. Um, constant checking up, constant accompaniment. This is always a cue. When someone comes in, and of course, when it's a child, it's difficult to sort that out because typically children don't seek health care on their own until they're at least teenagers. So that's a harder one to, to differentiate. But the partner who's there with the pregnant woman and never moves a step away and seems over solicitous, that's a cue. Or the woman in the ER, then the partner says, no, I'll, I'll stay here while you do the exam. And the woman is, is often typically looking at her shoes and the perp is asking the questions and answering the questions. And the woman is saying nothing or the victim is saying nothing. As I said, it's harder to sort out when you're talking about children because typically with younger children, especially the, the historian is going to be the parent or guardian, the person who accompanies the child. So that's a little bit harder to sort out. So psychological abuse certainly is as important as any of the others. Warning signs. Uh, in a healthcare setting, particularly missed appointments. You know, the person's a no-show yet again particularly in prenatal care, when we have women on every month and then every two weeks and then every week schedule. So all of a sudden, this person, we look at the record, and this person has missed more appointments than she's made. Something's going on. Um, or, in the case of emergency rooms, making repeat visits for some vague symptoms. And I'll talk about some of those symptoms as part of screening. These include signs of anxiety. The person is wringing her hands, um, perspiring, won't make eye contact, uh, seems jumpy if you open the exam room door and it happens to be a loud door, the person startles. You know, most of us don't startle unless it's a very loud noise. And that kind of behavior says this person is very anxious and, and, and on edge. 
flat affect or appearing de depressed or fearful, sort of watching the door to see if something's going to happen. Um, won't, the person won't make eye contact, mutters responses, and of course we have to take language into account here because clearly if the person's first language is not English and the provider's first language is English, you're going to get some blank looks if you can't communicate, but taking that into account, the individual who just doesn't make eye contact, unless this, this is where culture is also important, unless the person comes from a culture where making eye contact with a stranger is considered rude then and we need to know that and recognize that that's not a sign of perhaps of anything else going on it's simply a sign of respect that you don't make eye contact um, as so many of us are used to doing particularly with those of us who are healthcare providers you know make every effort to make eye, eye contact with with our patients suicidal ideation person talking about um, that yes, I have thought about killing myself, or I'm very depressed, and I don't know, what, or just things like I don't feel like it's worth living anymore, or, or I'm wondering how much longer I can hang on. Um, sometimes it's more subtle than that. Uh, <clears throat> someone who seems to have very low self-esteem, who apologizes for everything in the exam room. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, sorry. And you think but you didn't do anything, you know, I'm just examining you. And I've, I've examined women like this who apologize for every little thing. And you think, something's going on. Uh, flinching with touch, someone who is very um, sensitive to being touched, does not want to be touched. And this, in my line of work, and Barbara's too for that matter, when we're doing pelvic exams, that's a real cue. If the woman is just absolutely freezes at the thought of a pelvic exam, something has happened to this woman. Uh, overweight or underweight, um, some perpetrators will feed their victims um, and then so that they gain weight, they'll f practically force feed them and then they'll turn around and say, you know, you're a fat slob and what am I doing with you and, and the other extreme of that is withholding food. So the woman barely has enough food. Wasn't that case in uh, Plainville? A few years ago, wasn't that one of the tactics, as I remember, of that, that batterer on his family? He limited how much money his wife had to buy groceries, and so the kids were underweight, and they were trying to figure out tactics to get more food. They were using all kinds of ruses. The, the kids and the mom were in, in cahoots, essentially, and that's how they got away from him, too. They, all, they planned it together because the kids were old enough to participate, but you know, it's pretty devastating. Uh, insomnia, woman who comes in, or a man who comes in and just looks exhausted. And you say, have you not been sleeping well? Well, some things have been going on at home. And then you find out that, that this poor person has been kept up all night long by haranguing, yelling, music, noise, drugs, whatever. Um, Hypervigilant and suspicious. Who's that person? Who's this coming in the room with you? Or difficulty concentrating, and we could see this as, as um, teachers when we have students who just don't seem to be able to concentrate in class. And, and as we sort it out, no, it isn't that they're also working 60 hours a week at a job in order to be in school, but something's going on. Psychosomatic complaints. Complaints for which we can't find any organic basis. Certainly there's plenty of psychological basis, but not organic. Unexplained and vague illnesses, uh, headaches, insomnia, a feeling of choking, people who hyperventilate, so they're breathing very rapidly and shallowly and sometimes even can faint from that. Gastrointestinal symptoms, chest pain, back pain, and pelvic pain. Those are all kinds of pain that are difficult to diagnose many times. The, the laundry list for those last three kinds of pain in the differential diagnosis is about this long. And when you can't find any causative reason, think something either is currently going on or has gone on with this person. It never takes off a jacket or something. There may be bruises here on her arms or his arms that they don't want seen. Uh, bruises in different stages of of healing and I'm going to show you a very short clip of a videotape in a minute because it illustrates better than I can talk about um, how to 
pick out physical symptoms that may indicate abuse. All the way up to uh, detached retinas, subconjunctival bleeding in the eyes, so all of a sudden the person has a bloodshot looking eye, or swelling of the eyes, and a story that just doesn't make sense. Um, people can also have old healed scars from bruises and or burns, cigarette burns in particular, and as you're doing, if you're a healthcare professional, or if you're a friend, and your friend has a sleeveless thing on, and you say, gee, what are those scars in the back of your arm? Oh, well, I ran into this or that, and you think, yeah, but they're round. They look like cigarette burns. You know, that's pretty characteristic. Um, it's hard to get a burn that's symmetrical in a round shape without it being either a, a round-shaped implement or a cigarette. So you say burns, you know, a splash burn from frying, deep frying chicken is not going to give you a round burn that's symmetrical, especially on the back of your arm. Decreased hearing, many women have had ruptured eardrums from being boxed in the head, and children have too. And a woman who gives a history of several miscarriages, low birth weight babies, um, babies who are born before 40 weeks, that's, that's a cue. And, you, and there's no um, physiological reason or underlying chronic disease that might account for those. You say, hmm, you know, this is something to be concerned about. Okay, let's go for the... Okay, tracking. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'll I stop it for a minute. So. Stop it and put it back in. I can't rewind it too much because. Uh, Just a little. Okay, let's try that. I had this all queued up. <laughs> You've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward you, though. Yeah. I know. I'm doing that purposely because I had it queued up. He is a registered nurse in this area with or. Okay. Sometimes I start talking and start doing it the wrong way. That's why I feel. Sorry about this, I had it all queued up and then I wasn't tracking right. about a whole bunch of F words that you can say in public. Okay? And I want
boyfriend or husband is not documented? Earlier, there are. No. I'll just yeah. abandon it. Yeah. <laughs> Joelle, and while we're waiting for that, I'm not sure if you're aware, but one of our local hospitals, um, as part of their admission assessment, whether you're going in to have a consolation or whether you're going into the ER, there's always a question now on that admission has that anyone is... harmed you um, because it's so prevalent in this area. So everyone gets asked that. That's and wonderful. Also a program that you can have pictures taken of bruises and be put over in social service. It's not anything that gets put on that mm. ER chart. And um, if you should ever want to bring this person to court, yeah. you need evidence that's put in a social service area, maybe yeah. even under a separate name or a false name. I was, I was name. interested in what Joellen said, though. I wonder if they do that just to clarify. me, or at least we're an eye-to-eye -eye contact. It's a very simple technique. So you are now going to be asking her questions where her abuser has told her, if you tell anybody, you're going to get it worse. And now we're now asking you to ask her these questions. Very simple technique. I don't think we have time for that. Intentional injuries to there the body. There we go. Sorry about that. I had it all carefully queued up. Injuries that can be hidden by clothing. These guys are not going ballistic. These guys do not have this impulse control problem and just go wild and they lose control. Many of these guys know exactly where they're hitting her. They're hitting her with a purpose. They're hitting her in areas that are going to help control her, keep her isolated in that home. The injuries are often hidden. And often there are treatment delays. As with child abuse, if a woman is going to try to take care and nurse herself at home, often will not see treatment until the injuries aren't getting better or maybe her abuser has now gone out of town on business and maybe she can sneak in and get the appointment to see the doctor this treatment delays. Now there's a couple of forensic buzzwords I want you to write down and memorize. One of them is called a patterned injury. A patterned injury is where you have reasonable certainty what object or by what mechanism that injury occurred. That is a similar sounding word to a pattern of injuries. The pattern of other injuries, as Pat referred to Sorry. earlier, are injuries inflicted over time. Bruises in various stages of healing. Uh, multiple root fractures in various stages of healing. Old scars, new wounds. There is this pattern, there's a time element here. I can't say with 100% certainty that this was caused by an electrical cord, but I'm pretty darn sure. This so, is I don't know if you can cord see, light. but... Now look at the age of this, Two. and look at the age of this injury there. Right? Lines of injury. They're not. If you look carefully, here is an old, healed, loop scar. This woman has a pattern of patterned injuries. If she were to say to me, this is the first time my husband is with me with the cord, I can confront her, hopefully in a positive tone, with the fact that she has a pattern of patterned injuries. Now what caused this injury right over here? It's not an iron. A heel of a shoe. After this woman was down, then she was stomped on. I would document that as a pattern heel-like contusion. Here's another pattern heel. 
There's the rest of the foot coming up over her shoulder. This one is not as clearly demarcated a pattern as this one. Now obviously, you'd want to do a review of systems. Something that's causing that sort of contusion, I'm going to want to be ruling out kidney involvement. I'm going to want to be ruling out diaphragmatic involvement, lung involvement. Someone who's been kicked this high to the back, you got to rule out hemonumothoraxes. This probably wouldn't be a walk-in clinic. This probably would be coming in from an emergency room. But we don't know if she's pregnant on the other side. You see her back right now. But if she's pregnant, okay, obviously, that introduces a lot of other things we want to be looking at. But this woman, again, had pattern injuries and a pattern of injuries. Breast injuries are extremely common. I have photographed a lot of breast injuries. Not surprisingly, I've not had a lot of permission to show those as teaching slides, but I have photographed and you will see frequently injuries to the breast, biting injuries to the nipple areas. We would certainly suspect abuse if we saw this. This is a the pattern stomp injury. Here's the point of impact from the foot. It pushed all the blood to the side. We would suspect something big time went on here, right? But how many of us have awakened in the morning to find bruises on our thighs and we have no idea how they got there? No idea. Most likely we bumped the corner of a table. But a nurse practitioner saw this and she also saw this little circular punch injury here and she had a few other subtle injuries. And she said, the injuries you have look like they may have been caused by someone. Has anyone hurt you? And sure enough, someone had. This is what you'll see in your practices. This is what you'll see on your friends, on your neighbors, on your family. Punch injuries to the arm are extremely common. She was punched twice. What arm is that? Left arm. Left arm, one, two, three punches there. Left arm, he was wearing a ring, gave her a curvilinear abrasion. Here's some more of these looped cord-like injuries. Okay, this woman had a middle on the fracture. Look at her general health. Does she look healthy? She thought she was fat. He had called her a fat slut and a fat pig and you fat, ugly, fat, fat, fat. She, she, she was anorexic as hell, but she thought she was fat. But if, you know, maybe some women eating may be one of the few things some women can control. So maybe some women who are overly obese, because he's been called fat so many times, at some level she says, you think this is fat, watch, and she may overeat. Okay, don't, how old is that? Can't tell is the best answer. Can't tell. Do not sit there and try to date injuries. Do not say approximately seven to 10 day old. We know that's not a yesterday bruise, but don't try to date it. Because if someone says, you know, the doctor writes approximately seven to 10 day old contusion, and the defense attorney will point out, but to members of the jury, your honor, my client was out of town seven to 10 days ago, but he was in town six days ago and 11 days ago. You describe it by its size, its color, if it has a texture, and then you would write in your assessment that the bruise to her arm is consistent with her history of being hit seven days ago, six days ago. If she says she was hit an hour ago, we know that's not an hour ago injury. So I would write in my assessment the injury to her arm is not consistent with her history of being struck an hour ago. As you can see, these are very poignant pictures, which is why I wanted to show you just some idea of what we as clinicians face in collecting data when patients present to us. Sarah Buell had three pregnancies during, she's the woman who's now a lawyer who was a district attorney in Massachusetts, she's now down in Texas. She tells stories of going to her prenatal care provider with bruises and other injuries and making up these cockamamie stories of how it happened and not one provider ever picked up that there wasn't any relationship between what they were seeing physically and how she could possibly have injured herself. For example, typically bruises will be here on victims. Why? Because what do we do when someone's coming at our face? We go like this. So we get bruises on the back of our arm. How often do we injure the backs of our arms running into things? No, we injure the front because we're walking like this and we hit the corner of the table or hit the chair like I just did. So there, there are lots of things we can do as providers, as teachers, um, as students to say to our roommates and say, you know, how did you do that to yourself? What, what happened? That's a nasty looking bruise. Um, it's a big clue. Just to finish up in a couple of minutes on caring for victims of abuse. Remember that many victims of abuse, whether they are uh, children, adult, young adults, adults, or older adults, can have post-traumatic stress responses, 
much like our military personnel have coming back from war, there's a similar syndrome that we see in victims of abuse because it's almost like living in a war zone to be in an abusive situation, particularly when that abusive situation is in our homes. Coping strategies that the person is using are not pathology and shouldn't be labeled that way. Um, they're the ways that this woman, this man, this older adult gets through the day by whether it's smoking, whether it's whatever. It may be the only way this individual can cope with what's going on. So don't tackle the smoking first of all. Find out what's going on underneath it and then, then we'll talk about smoking cessation down the line. Uh, substance abuse is often self-medication. Victims tell stories of the pain that they've been in. The only thing that relieved the pain was substance use. Smoking pot, um, taking coke. Not, not in our uh, eyes as healthcare providers the best coping mechanisms, but it may be the only thing the victim has available at the time. Um, Non-judgmental is so important. Um, one of, as part of our research, we trained providers at, at our eight different prenatal sites how to screen for abuse using the abuse assessment screen. And one of the frustrations, most of these individuals are nurses because in prenatal care settings, most of the time the in, initial prenatal visit and screening is done by a nurse. And they would say, but the women don't want to leave. It's so frustrating. They reveal all this abuse and then they don't want to leave. No, they probably can't. They probably have emotional, financial, and other ties to the perpetrator. And it's going to take a long time, if ever, for the woman to realize that she can manage on her own, and, or maybe she doesn't want to give up the relationship. Maybe she feels that she will, and rightly so probably, that she will economically suffer terribly if she leaves the relationship. So we as caregivers have to just be there for the woman, uh, be there for the older adult, offer alternatives, always support the victim in that it's not your fault, but at the same time be patient. That was the one frustration that almost without exception that, that providers shared with us. Well, she won't leave or, you know, I don't understand this. And we just have to be there. Um, advocacy for safety and building options. Um, certainly in the, the bigger picture is advocating for information about abuse, about hotlines, about how to make an escape plan, about alternatives to living in an abusive situation be available in our study sites, in our practice sites, and in our colleges and universities as you've talked about so that we get the word out that this is not right, it's not acceptable, and that there is help available if and when someone wants to um, take care of it. Um, working together. One of the things that we've learned, probably the m most important thing we've learned through this project is our need to collaborate with one another. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, our next phase of our project is a collaborative project with the VNA and the police in a community. We are modeling after a project out in Greenfield, Massachusetts with the VNA, the one hospital that's in Greenfield, and the police department. And in the community we're currently working in, in coalition building, people in the community who offer services across the age span to persons who are victims of some form of violence or witnesses to violence say to us almost uniformly, uniformly, the police are working with you? Yes. And if they're not in our corner, we're dead. Because who's the first respondent many times in a domestic? It's the police. Who has to enforce those restraining orders that are done legally, but who's the enforcer? The police department. So if we're not working closely with our colleagues in social work, I'm talking as a nurse now, in social work, in psychology, because we're working with psychologists who are part of a child witness to violence program, in the police department, um, in clergy in the community, the school system, if we're not all working together, we can't manage this problem alone. And also, as people who work in this area will, will say, you'd burn out if you were alone. If you had the whole weight of this problem on your shoulders, all of us would feel like we couldn't continue to do it. But be, when we work together, 
we share the burden. So, any questions? I'll stay, take materials. I have one question. Sure. It's a frustration to me. We have a lot of international students or students first generation, and you mentioned that in some culture, some countries, this is acceptable hmm. behavior. And a lot of times here, when people are arrested, they go, I didn't know this was illegal here. Hmm. Have you heard of any educational efforts for? Yes. It, it, in fact, uh, one of the things we're going to be doing in this project, because there are a lot of new immigrants in the community right. we're working in, is community education about what is a crime in this country, in this commonwealth, and what behaviors between individuals are acceptable and not acceptable. So really get the word out and not instantly blame a perpetrator who may not, who may very innocently not be aware that behavior is, and, and not to come down hard the first time when there's an offense. But um, in fact, the domestic violence officer were we're working with said that he spends a lot of times talking a lot of time talking to the perpetrator and sometimes with an interpreter to try to get the understanding across that you may have been able to do this in the country you came from but this is a crime in the United States so they tend not to throw the book at the person the first time and really um, if if there clearly is what seems to be a credible story of I really didn't know this was wrong um, and work with community individuals who are leaders in that particular community, whatever the ethnic origins are, to say, is this in fact true and, you know, can you help us in, in the community, communicating that this is, whether it's people from Dominican Republic or whatever, you know, that this is not... Um, this is the United States of America, and you have to live under the laws here. And I guess the churches would be a good link there. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, but it's one of the ways to tackle that concern, because it's a big concern. Mm. Definitely. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>